All right, I think we'll just, uh, let's go ahead and go for it. Um, so hello, everybody out there. If you're watching on uh, the YouTube live stream via Twitter, uh, my name is Mickey Fisher. I am a writer and producer for television out here in Los Angeles. Um, I've created a couple of shows. I created a show called uh, Extant that ran on CBS for a couple of seasons. And I created a show called Reverie that ran on NBC for a season. Um, and I'm here with all these people today to do a sort of mock you in version of a pitch, a television pitch for a series. Um, and it all started with this uh, tweet from Danielle Nikki, uh, a writer here who, um, who, who I, not too long ago tweeted that, uh, you know, that instead of take your daughter to work day that we should do, or in addition to take your daughter to work day, we should do take a writer to a pitch day. And I, uh, I thought, well, I can do that. I'll volunteer to do that because I have a pitch that I could do for some reasons, which I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, but because this is going to be a uh, sort of mock pitch, I am wearing what I would normally wear and doing the kind of things I would normally do um, and have done on these pitches. So, um, so I thought I'd give you just a brief visual description for anybody. If we have writers who are visually impaired who are uh, tuning in, I'm wearing a black button down short sleeve shirt with a white t-shirt underneath, which is pretty similar. It's kind of like my uniform, <laughs> like that's my writer uniform, uh, what I wear to a pitch. Um, I have an office that I work out of uh, out in the garage, but there are a lot of toys and sort of distractions and things it's a little obnoxious out there. So I have started pitching uh, in our, our guest bedroom, which is my girlfriend's office. Um, and I really like it because it's a little bit more of a calming space. There are a couple white chairs behind me and there are a couple of beds behind that. And then there are two windows at the back um, with plenty of natural light streaming in. So it's kind of a calm and, uh, and, and sort of relaxing place, uh, which is good because this is a sort of like, you know, can be a highly stressful uh, event. Um, so, so that's what I'm coming to you live from today. And I thought that let's, um, in the same spirit, let's, I'm going to go around and have these people introduce themselves to you. Um, and we have a couple ASL interpreters who are joining us as well today. Um, and, and that way you get used to hearing our voice as we go along, because there will be some questions and input later. Um, so yeah, Danielle, let's start with you, because you're, you're, you're the kick this whole thing off. Sure. Hey everybody, I'm Danielle Mickey. I am a drama writer. I write both features and TV. I have yet to pitch, so I'm really excited to hear what you have to say, Mickey. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, thank you. Melissa, you want to jump in next? We'll just go in the order we went in for. Sure. I'm Melissa London Hilfers. Um, I too write for film and television. I'm currently working on a show for Fox. Um, at today, however, I am the head of drama for a major network. Uh, Hi, my name is Robin Fusco. I am also a TV drama writer. I am just getting started on pitching, so I'm very excited to be here and learning from you all. I'm Lisa J. I write horror features mainly. I'm newly repped and um, really uh, anxious about starting to pitch, so I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for this, Mickey. Thank you. James, you want to jump in? Yeah, I am uh, I'm James Alexander. I am a TV dramedy writer and very much like Lisa, it is also something that gives me a ton of anxiety. So I'm happy to hear from a pro or a couple of pros and um, learn whatever I can. Awesome. And like I said, we have two ASL interpreters today. Uh, we have Justin and Trevina who are both with us uh, for any deaf writers who may be tuning in. Um, and then my dog may make an appearance or two at some point as well. Just, uh, just, just give me the heads up, pitching from home. Um, so, so like I said, how this came to be, um, Danielle had, had, uh, tweeted this thing about taking a writer to a pitch. And I realized that, yeah, it's kind of a weird thing that we, you know, that you're expected to do once you break in, but if you've never seen it, it is sort of like a mysterious thing. So this is, this is really in the spirit of just like shining a light on the process. Um, you know, the, my main caveat at first is that like, this is just how one person does. And I'm going to check in with Melissa. We're going to talk a little bit about it as we go along and, and sort of cross-reference and see her sort of best practices. Um, but like any writing advice that you guys get as you're, you know, on Twitter and things that, and that we all get, um, you got to take what works for you and, and your mileage may vary. And there are as many ways to do this and structure these things and, and uh, successful pitches as there are writers. I truly believe that. Um, but one of the reasons that I volunteered is because um, this is an original pitch that I took out last year and did not sell. And so I think that it would be hard for a writer who, um, you know, if you took out a pitch that was based on IP or, you know, studio bought your pitch that you may not necessarily own it. There may be like tricky rights issues and people may not feel totally comfortable doing that. Um, or if they'd written something 
that um, that they still had intentions of doing, you know, like taking it out again or, or turning into something else. Um, this one is dead. <laughs> like this, this pitch is dead because there is a global pandemic at the heart of it. Uh, and there are a lot of elements that are things that we're living through right now. And so I really feel like we missed our window. Like even if we were in, if we were in production right now, my heart would be sinking like, well, would anybody really want to watch this uh, given all that we've been going through? Um, and so along those lines, I just want to say too that um, I did, this is a little bit like watching going in a time machine and watching me do this pitch a year ago because I didn't rewrite it based on the fact that we're going through this thing right now. Um, it would just meant rewriting it and learning, you know, new things and trying to constantly, you know, test about how to reference like where we are today. And then I just, I just kept it as is. So if it seems a little like, um, you know, that we're not acknowledging this stuff, that's the, that's the reason. Um, so I thought, because there might be people joining us at all sort of levels, so I thought really briefly, like how you get to this point um, for X and a reverie, how you get to the point where you're in a room pitching to you know, to a buyer. Um, with both X and reverie, they started as spec scripts. I mean, I, I was off on my own, out in the wilderness, wrote a pilot, wrote overview documents for both of those things. With X, uh, I partnered with a showrunner named Greg Walker, and he and I took that sort of core thing. We developed it into you know the much bigger pitch that we actually took out to a few different places, um, and sold with our producing partners with Amblin Television, um, and then with Reverie, I wrote the pilot, uh, partnered with Amblin Television again, and then um, really worked and reworked the pitch with them, and then at that point it was about um, strategizing with them and strategizing with the reps, and sort of figuring out who would be the ideal buyers for something like this, like making a target list. Um, and, you know, gathering intel, who has something like this in development, who has something in production already, who just did something like this that didn't quite work, you know, so maybe they're not going to be as interested, um, and then setting those targets. Another way to get to this point is is you, you either option IP yourself, or you go out and you win a job adapting IP for somebody else, like a, a production company or a studio may have the rights to a book, uh, short story, a video game, an app, you know, anything like all kinds of stuff these days. Um, and they're looking for writers. And so you go in and you pitch your take on it, like what appeals to you about it and how you would, um, how, you know, like sort of the gist of how you would approach this material. Um, and then from there, if you win that job, adapting that IP, you partner with them to build off this pitch. And then the same process, you strategize and take it to the buyers. Um, so those are sort of a couple ways to do that. Uh, and Melissa, this would be one of the places where I can jump in. It's like, would you mind talking about the pitch that you that you sold and how that happened? So that one, uh, it's an atypical one and it's gonna sound really, really good. And it's so good that something like this has never happened to me before, but, there, it, but it's, it leads into something helpful. Um, so the show that I'm currently working on, I went in to meet with um, the head of drama at Fox really for a general because we were, um, had had a really good experience the year before working on a show that I had sold them, but did not go. Um, and he knew that I had been cooking this idea and there was a producer that was involved. And he said, like, just give me a little sneak peek. So I wasn't nervous at all. It was really just like a hangout and I, and he bought it. But that's not normal. And I can, it's really not normal. Um, I said to Damon Lindelof, is this what it's like to be you? And he said, that's never happened to me, Melissa. Like, it's not normal. So, but, but here's why it is helpful maybe. Um, the reason I got that job is because I had worked on another show for them um, and worked and worked and worked and worked and it didn't happen, but they saw that I would work really, really hard and do whatever it took. And they saw um, that I was someone they wanted to be partnered with. So it really kind of goes to the message of like, this is all about relationships and you go in one day and you don't sell it. And then the next day they remember you and they bring you back. So that's not a, it's not, it's not a great example. Um, it's like the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's awesome. But, um, but yes, but otherwise it's pretty much happened. And the only other thing I would add to what you said is um, there are multiple, when you're pitching on IP, you basically have to pitch it multiple times because you go in and you have to win it, as you said, um, against other writers sometimes. And then once that happens, then you have to refine it with them and then go into the network. So it's, it, and you know, you don't get paid for any of that, so. Yeah, it's a lot of work and then sometimes you just don't get the job. This is heartbreaking. Um, so once you've narrowed those targets down and you set the meetings, um, the, I've found that the meetings generally themselves all follow a pretty similar structure in, uh, in real life and, in, you know, in person and on zoom. And, and so, you know, typically like you've, you've 
hold it up with your partners shortly before, you know, day before and the days before to decide who's going to say what, if you're going in with producers, um, they're, they're generally going to tee you up. And so essentially like there's always a little bit of small talk, you know, as people are settling in, um, I most likely like the people that you're producing partners have worked with these people before they've crossed paths. They have a show on the air already or had a show on the air. They're always like really good vibes at the beginning. Like, everybody's hopeful. I've never walked into a room that was just like, you know, felt hostile at the beginning because I think everybody generally has an interest in like, this is going to work out together. Um, people, they say that for actors a lot, you know, in, in the room, like the people behind the table are genuinely hoping that you're going to be the right person for the role. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and on Zoom, I find that the small talk as people are sort of logging on and figuring out technical difficulties, it's just sort of like, how's everybody holding up right now? Um, hey, that's a cool room you're in. Danielle, what's up with those butterflies? You know, like things like that. Like, so uh, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, at a certain point, the, the executive will sort of like call it to order by saying something like, hey, we're excited to hear what you brought us today. That's the producer's cue to take the ball and they're going to talk generally about like what drew them to this material, you know, what made them excited about this um, in the first place, and then why they think you're the perfect writer. I think in an ideal situation, they're a bit like your hype man. They're setting you up for success. And, uh, and then they're going to turn it over to you and it's your, and it's your, your turn to do it. Um, I'm going to double back for a quick second um, before I jump into it, just to, what I want to do is just point out like, the sort of blueprint of the structure that's going to give you some headlines of how I approach this. So you can see how that plays out as I do it. Um, and again, your mileage may vary. This is sort of just how I approach it. And generally most of the pitches that I do, again, this one didn't sell <laughs> out there, but I have sold pitches that follow this sort of same structure for me. And, and there are all, a, a number of elements that are um, s s the similar from pitch to pitch. I may rearrange them slightly differently, um, but it always starts with like a personal way in. Why did I want to tell this story? Where did this start? So for instance, with Reverie, the pitch started with, I'd been reading a bunch of stuff about virtual reality and how places like Google had spent, you know, a billion dollars to, you know, getting us to hopefully spend more time in virtual worlds. And I'd never used it. So I ordered Google Cardboard, $20 piece of cardboard, stuck my phone inside, and it like blew my mind that that's like, even that little bit of it was so much fun. And that's kind of led, uh, led me into it. Um, and so from there, that personal way in, so it can sort of naturally lead you into the themes and the and the themes are really um, there's an important question I find it's even more and more important like in the recent pitches which is why now why tell this story now why why would somebody be compelled to buy this and put this on the air when there are so many other options um, and then why you why you're the perfect person to tell it I feel like with IP that it's important to sort of like what's your personal connection to it what what are the themes that drew you in if you have created it, then I feel like that's that's sort of embedded into the DNA, but it does help to say, like, here are the things that I'm passionate about. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about that too. Um, there's a log line. I'll generally give them a log line that encapsulates things early on, something that they can sort of scribble down some keywords and, you know, because they're going to have to communicate it to somebody later. I'll talk about the tone. I give a couple of two or three tonal comps to just help them triangulate as they're hearing this, what this is going to feel like. Um, and then, uh, and then I really like, I generally like to just jump in and int introduce the characters through the action of the pilot. That's kind of my, my normal method. I've done it a couple different ways, but I tend to like introducing people on the fly as you set up their problems and you set up the world. Um, but when I do pitch the pilot, I don't focus on like beat by beat drive plot stuff. It's very much like, here's the world, here are the characters, here are the dynamics, here are the emotional stories and a few big like tentpole moments. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty brief, uh, you know, I would say like three to five minutes. Uh, after that, I'll talk about season one and it's, and again, it's sort of in big broad terms of characters and emotional arcs and things like that. Um, you'll see in this one, there's a mystery engine that I kind of deal with pretty quickly. And then I talk about the characters emotional arcs in season one. Uh, and then I'll spend a, a two or three paragraphs, just a couple, a minute, two minutes on future seasons. Um, I think there's a misconception among a lot of writers that you have to say, and then in episode two, this happens and in episode six, this happens. And, and people are really not, you know, expecting you to have all that um, laid out in that kind of detail, but they want to hear like the broad emotional arcs and what the, what those kind of stories are. You know, like Billy Ray, so what's the simple emotional story? The more you can pitch that, the better. Um, and so once I pitch those couple seasons, there's two couple things that are sort of unique to this. I do have a specific like 
you know, image and sequence I'd kind of like to end on. So I can really pitch the, the end of what I'd love to see with this series. Um, and then I had an idea that this could potentially like in success be a global franchise, um, which is, you know, like in, I, in the business, they call that delusions of grandeur. <laughs> but I went for it because I thought um, that it could be very cool. So Melissa, before I jump into the pitch, um, oh, and I guess I'll talk this and I'm going to hand to you to see if you're, if you follow anything similar to that. Once I have that structure, I just rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it. I memorize it sort of backwards and forwards. Um, I do it a couple times a day. Um, I record myself doing it. Um, I don't really ever film myself doing it, which one, Danielle, was one of the questions. I guess I'll just answer it on the fly here. Uh, but I, I voice memo it so I can listen to it while I'm hiking and things like that. And I find that like working it that hard helps me because um, I always open up and you'll see with Melissa, I'm going to say, Hey, you know, we're open for you know questions if you have things along the way. And so that does happen. And so if somebody asks me a question that has to do with like something late season, I can pivot to that, but then I can sort of just like, you know, I'll, if I'm really comfortable with it into my bones, I can bring it back to, um, to those original things. So, um, yeah. And so Melissa, is that, do you follow a similar process at all? It's almost identical. Um, the only things, that I would add occasionally, and now I'm second guessing, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Um, before I go into the pilot, I sometimes go through the characters one by one, especially if it's a show that has a big, like for example, I'm doing this multi-generational drama, like a lot of characters and I'm afraid they might be confused. I sometimes go through um, and, and give them a little description of each of the characters. Um, but I don't know, I mean, if you can do it, go straight to the pilot and do it. It's, that's a much more streamlined way to do it. Um, the other thing I would add, and I've done um, heavy drama, dramedy, and comedy, um, pitched all of those. And I think when you're pitching, the tone of your pitch should echo the tone of your show. Um, you always do drama, so you you know are always dramatic, I guess. <laughs> um, but I just think it's something to keep in mind. Um, and the other thing, the other thing to add, this is so tiny, but um, I don't know if getting dressed is a bigger um, has like a bigger delta for women, but I also sort of dress for the tone of the show. I probably way overthink it, but my show's a country show and I went in wearing like a country shirt the first time I went in to meet with the president of the network. Um, but I just feel like you want to get them in the mood. And I, I feel that when I read scripts as well, like I think the stage direction should also be written in the tone of the, of the show. So, um, but otherwise it's, I mean, almost exactly. And I record myself as well and listen as torturous as it is. I mean, I mean are, are there things that like, is there, a, a, I know it's for different writer to writer too, but is there like a general uniform for a, a woman who's going in to pitch a television show? Like, you know, you, like for guys, you're like, you don't want to go in like a suit and tie. It's not that, it's like a job interview. Like yeah. That. I usually see like a lot back in the day when we would go pitch and lob, you know, you're sitting in the lobby first. Um, I would see like a whole bunch of guys in black t-shirts or shirts like what you're wearing. And then I would be wearing like whatever I'm wearing and it was colorful or whatever. Um, I I normally wear some sort of like dressier jeans and a shirt with a jacket, or if it's hot that day, just a shirt and some kind of cool shoes. And I often have a conversation with female executives about my shoes, uh, not necessarily relevant. Although perhaps because some of the shows I do, like fashion is a part of the show. So again, I don't think you can really overthink it, yeah. um, but you know, that's- That's great. Me. No, that's good to know. I think that, um, yeah, it's funny because that the shoes, watches, like I've been, you know, like that's some of the small types of times, like you end up in those sort of things. Um, conversation pieces, uh, all cool. Um, so before I jump in, I'm going to tell you the two pieces of advice that I always follow um, when I start thinking about doing this. And that there are two pieces are, um, when I, I started off as an actor and I really learned that like, it, you know, in an audition techniques class, which is like, this may be your one chance to perform the role. So when you go in for this audition, this may be your one chance to play this part. So you really want to enjoy that, enjoy it as performance and leave it on the floor. And I approach that the same way, thinking of it like, this may be the only audience that ever gets to hear this story. If this never makes it to air, these four people, this is my, this is my chance to tell. So I really try to just like relish that fact and enjoy it. Um, and the other thing, I've tweeted this before, but I think about this every time I'm going to think about it right now, because I am a little nervous. I'm not sure how many people are watching, you know, out there, but even doing it for you guys, like I have a certain number of nerves, like certain amount of nerves. And, you know, that during the day where like a little like flare, you know, panic would come in, right? So there's a lot of adrenaline for these aspects. Um, but Prince, uh, the night that he and the revolution were going to play like the big show at First Avenue that was going to be recorded and form the basis for a lot of the songs that were going to be the Purple Rain soundtrack. He knew this was like a career defining show. 
And so he, and he knew that nerves would be really high. And so he told the band that when you hear the beat and your adrenaline and everything starts to kick in and you start to feel that rush, cut your body time in half, cut it down by 50% um, because you're going to get carried away by the adrenaline and you're going to rush. And so I always think about that because as you're going through this, you know, like ideally you're trying to get people to connect emotionally to your story. And I find that if you're too, you know, if you're at this pace, cause you're like hyper caffeinated or you're just super excited that, uh, that you can rush through those things and, and you want to give them some time to land. Um, so I think that's it. Um, as I think I can jump in. So uh, I'm going to pretend that you are all. I'm going to tell your... you to jump in. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Um, and you guys all executives. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, we're so excited to hear what you're going to present. Please, Great. let's get started. Well, this, this, and I'm going to say, I mean, the first thing I would say is, Melissa, and by the way, thank you so much for um, for taking the time to hear this today. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, this is something really, uh, really excited about. I've been thinking about this since November 2016, since shortly after the election. You know, I started thinking a lot about younger generations and the enormous challenges that they're up against with things like climate crisis and, and gun violence and this sort of like this rise of white nationalism and all these things that, that, that started happening. And it really felt like that the decisions that we make right now are going to have enormous consequences for these generations down the line. And, you know, to be honest, like right now, it's not looking great for them. Uh, you know, temperatures and sea levels are rising. There are, you know, mass shootings are more frequent. Um, you know, all these things are going on. It seems like that we are headed, things, things are headed to a very bad place and eventually, potentially uh, to uh, an extinction level event. And it's an extinction level event that you and I may not be around to see, but our you know, kids and grandkids uh, down the line may, uh, may be there to witness. But even, even though I've you know, been in those sort of dark uh, doom scrolling places and the sort of dark trains of thought, there have been these rays of hope with kids like the, the kids from uh, Parkland, Florida, who inspired millions of people to take to the streets with, you know, in favor of common sense gun reform, or uh, Little Miss Flint, who raised a lot of money for you know, fresh water for, for kids in Flint, Michigan, or Greta Thunberg, who sailed the Atlantic to bring awareness to climate change. And so A, just being really inspired by that and seeing what they were doing, uh, it got me thinking about this question is like, what would it look like if the power to fix these big problems, true power to fix these big problems was placed in the hands of the generation that was gonna be around to face those consequences? Um, and that is the big question at the heart of EPIC, uh, E-P-O-C-H, and, and, and a def defining era of time. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a one hour drama. It's about a family from a small Midwestern town who who find their, alert, their lives turned upside down when their oldest son falls prey to this mysterious illness that is affecting millions of kids worldwide. And as these affected kids start to undergo this kind of strange, subtle metamorphosis, and then as the otherworldly nature of this illness is revealed, society begins to break down around them. And this is really a series about watching this family fight to hold itself together when all around them, it seems like the world is falling apart. Um, tonally, it shares a lot in common with um, some of my favorite things. Is the, you know, my sort of favorite genre is it's soulful science fiction, stuff like Contact or Close Encounters. Um, but there's also, I think it shares some DNA with uh, this sort of blue collar realism of one of my all time favorite shows, Friday Night Lights. Um, this is a show that has a big mystery engine that hopefully families, you know, parents and kids can get together and they're going to want to see what happens week after week. Um, but it's not a show that happens like in, you know, the halls of power. It doesn't take place in the Pentagon. There are no shadowy government operatives and things like that. This happens around, you know, kitchen tables and school classrooms. And it's all lens through these sort, you know, you know, small town folks. Um, and even though there are a number of adults as part of the story, uh, there is a strong YA component with this group of affected kids who, you know, despite the differences in their ages, their ethnicities, their religion, sexuality, abilities, disabilities, um, this is a group of kids who are all brought together and who are bonded by this shared burden of this uncommon purpose that's placed upon them. Um, so I wanna just say to uh, Melissa and, and, and team before I go that this is a conversation. So it's like at any point you wanna stop, wanna jump in and set up the world and go into the pilot. Um, but if you have questions, just feel free to flag me down along the way. I'll make sure to, I'll make sure to check in. Um, 
The show is set in a town called Mineral City, uh, Ohio, very much like the town I'm from called Ironton, uh, around 8,000 people, home to the oldest Memorial Day parade in the country. Um, a lot of the manufacturing and, and the industry that was there has, has sort of dried up. So now if a lot of people, who, if, you're, if you're living there, you're working in either healthcare or education, uh, which is exactly what Ben and Abby McGinnis are doing. Ben and Abby are in their 40s. Uh, I'll start with Abby. She uh, was born here. She was raised here. She went away to college, but when she graduated, she moved back because she wanted to make a difference in her community. She wanted to come back and, and serve these people who, who had really made such a difference in her life. And the way that she's doing that is uh, she's working as the director of the county health department. And right now, her biggest challenge is combating the opioid epidemic that is, uh, that is devastating families right now. Um, her husband, Ben, is a science teacher at the high school. He is not from here. He's from further north. And, um, but he met her in college, and he bought into her, her, her mission about this town. And he moved here with her. And it was really hard for him to fit in. You know, he's a guy who he's, you know, he's a northerner, he doesn't suffer fools, and he, um, he there's some, some sort of fundamental issues between them, where, you know, where she's just like raised in this Christian family and still has a very strong attachment to her faith. He is an avowed atheist, and even though they have a scene between them, like they've managed to make it work and they make it work for their kids, um, but it does bring up some tension from time to time if, let's say, like he's called into the, you know, principal's office to defend teaching the Big Bang or evolution, things like that. Um, they have uh, an, uh, their oldest son uh, is a kid named Graham. He is uh, 17 years old, senior in high school. Like a lot of uh, kids that age, he you know he's a really good kid, but he's lacking in ambition. He would much rather be hanging out with his uh, marching band buddies or his girlfriend than doing things like filling out his college applications. Much to the uh, dismay of his parents, who see all this potential in him and and feel like he's really just not living up to that. Um, He's got a younger sister named Liddy, who's in the eighth grade. Liddy's kind of the opposite of her brother. She is a perfectionist. A minus isn't good enough. It's got to be an A. <laughs> She's, and that, that, come, that kind of pressure comes with a little bit of a cost. She um, wears her heart on her sleeve. Like a lot of kids these days, she's totally addicted to YouTube, uh, you know, constantly taking in information, you know, st streaming information into her brain. Um, and then they have an older daughter named Maya, who is in her early 20s. Uh, Maya doesn't live in town anymore. She lives on an army base in North Carolina. She grew up here in the town, going to that Memorial Day parade and idolizing her grandfather, this guy who was a Vietnam vet, Purple Heart, um, and, and really like her mother, she wanted to serve this community. And, the, and her way of doing that was, was signing up, enlisting for the army. Um, again, much to the dismay of her parents who, who maybe had a different future planned for her. So put Maya away, we'll come back to her later, but she's not in town at the moment. Um, but that's the McGinnis family. They are the, the core of this story. And even though we're gonna meet people sort of, you know, all over the world um, and, uh, and, and, and even beyond at a certain point, this family is the emotional core of the story. My sort of North Star as I was creating this is if the family survives, humanity survives. Uh, and as a good dramatist, I'm gonna do everything I can to tear them apart. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just gonna jump into the pilot. Uh, in the opening of the pilot, Abby is on a ride along with Sheriff Jim Gillum, who's this guy who was like one of her oldest friends. They went to high school together. Uh, opening the pilot starts a breakneck pace. Lights and sirens going. They're like bombing through these country roads. Uh, they pull up to this gas station sort of out of the way. This young clerk rushes out, tears in her eyes. She's flagging them down. She takes them to this, um, to, to this bathroom in the back where this young man is overdosing and it's just like very intense sort of you know white knuckle scene as, as Abby and the sheriff they get there before the ambulance and they really have to fight to, to keep this person alive and they do they save his life sort of just in the nick of time and in the exhausted aftermath of that uh you know Abby's telling Sheriff Gillum like you know careful what you wish for because the whole reason that she came on this ride along was she wanted to get a look at what this opioid fight looks like on the ground uh, back home, Ben is going through a crisis of his own as he's trying to get the kids ready for school. Last night, one of Liddy's friends uh, photoshopped her school picture into a meme and it went like viral at the middle school and kids are making fun of her and she's utterly humiliated and she is like not going to school today. She may never go back to that school again. <laughs> she's yelling at him through the bathroom door. He's having this conversation with her. Meanwhile, like the smoke detector goes off downstairs. He rushes downstairs. Grandma's making breakfast. Forgot he had toast in because he was looking at his phone. Uh, and it just blows up into this fight where Ben is like, look, buddy, you, you can't just keep going sleepwalking through life. You have to take some responsibility. You got to start paying attention. 
and it blows up into this fight between the two of them. Um, and then finally he has to broker some peace. So he tells Liddy, fine, I'm going to let you skip school, but you're going to go to class with me. You're going to sit in my science class. You're going to learn science today, which is fine. So they go to the school, father and son part ways. They, uh, the tension's still hanging between them. They haven't resolved it. Uh, and then second period comes and changes everything. It is a, a turning point in the history of human evolution. Uh, 14 kids between the middle school and the high school just suddenly go unconscious in the blink of an eye, just drop over whether at their desks, at their lockers, on the, you know, on the gym floor, and it causes huge panic. Ben, uh, ben and uh, the principals and, and the teachers are all trying to figure out what's going on, uh, and it's particularly scary for Ben because one of those kids is his son, Graham. So they're trying to figure out, is this a gas leak? Is it something else? And so they're trying to evacuate the kids. Ambulances are, are arriving to get these kids to the hospital. And at the hospital, Abby meets them there and they learn for the first time that this isn't just happening in Mineral City, that this is happening all over the world. Like they're looking at a you know, the news report on the TV in the waiting room and this is happening everywhere. When the final numbers come in, just 12 million kids and kids in every country around the globe have fallen prey at the exact same time to this mysterious illness, whatever it is. Doctors are perplexed. They have no idea, you know, the cause, much less a cure for this. And these kids are, you know, for all, for all intents and purposes, they're in a coma. Outside the hospital, something really beautiful happens, which is, you know, in, in towns like this, people come to each other's aid and, and their people start showing up and they're holding this candlelight vigil and, and, and singing hymns and praying while inside it's this fight for these kids' lives. And, and, and the tension of this surfaces sort of underlying the fault line between Ben and Abby in the scene where Lydia's kind of freaking out because, you know, this is her brother, is going to be okay, is she next? Uh, and Abby says, well, look, what do we do when we're afraid? We pray, right? So she takes Abby's hand, takes Lydia's hands, they start to pray. Ben just gets up and walks out of the room. And afterwards, Abby's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, your daughter needed you. She needed to know that things are going to be okay. And Ben is like, I don't know if things are going to be okay. You know, like I, and I'm not going to sit there and pray. I don't, she knows I don't believe in this stuff. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. But, you know, as we're talking, he realizes, like, he fucked up. Like, he should have done more. And so he takes Liddy to the roof. Uh, it's nighttime out under the night sky. There's a sort of beautiful sea of candles and singing down below. It's a really beautiful scene between father and daughter. And he says to her, it's not just like, don't believe in God. It's that the universe is a vast and mysterious place. Anything can happen. Uh, it, there's a lot of uncertainty and I'm okay with uncertainty because I think that uncertainty leaves room for hope. And he's like, the one thing I do know is that I believe in science and I think the smartest people in the world are trying to figure this out. And I truly believe that your brother's gonna be okay. So we see this bonding moment between father and daughter. Um, and then the next morning, the kids just as suddenly wake up, not just Mineral City, kids around the world. It's huge relief. Looks like, you know, it's a miracle. Prayers have been answered, possibly. Um, but we can see the audience, like there's something going on with Graham. We're not quite sure what it is. Um, but the next day, Abby finds out. She goes to this uh, emergency meeting at the state health department. And an official there says to her, uh, you know, uh, all the assembled sort of county health directors and say, look, we're facing a public health crisis. Last night, a hospital in New York, they started running tests on some of these kids. And what they discovered was uh, that there is this like, dormant strand of DNA that has just suddenly been switched on. We have no idea how that happened or why or what it's doing, but these kids are changing on a fundamental biological level. Abby raises her hand, stands up, you know, she's, she pushes away the front and she's like changing into what? And the guy's like, we have no idea. But Graham kind of has an idea, or at least he's starting to get an idea. When he was in this coma, he had this very strange vision of this piece of like futuristic technology, something clearly not from earth, something he, you know, he'd never seen before, never imagined before. And, and out of the coma, he's in the hospital with these other kids and he starts explaining to this other kid who's like sketching in a sketchbook. And he's like, yeah, I saw this weird piece of technology and the kid's face goes white and he turns it around and he shows Graham the sketch and it is this exact same piece of technology that Graham saw. Holy shit, they saw the same thing. They do a quick poll, all the other kids saw the same thing. They go online. Every kid around the world who went through this, they're all, they're all looking and seeing the same thing. And not just seeing the same piece of technology, they all heard a message in a, in a voice, in a language that, that none of them had ever heard before, but they all understood the content of it. And the message was that you were chosen for a purpose. End of pilot. So <laughs> that's, going, that's a natural break point. I just want to check in with you. Do you have any questions so far? Is there anything you'd like to talk about? Uh, I just have one question. It's very specific. When you say Graham 
they all saw the same thing. Do we, are we in Graham's head when he's unconscious or do we not find out till he woke up? No, I think we're going to see it. I think like there is a, there is a strain where it's like a, a scene where we get to see what's in, what's in his head. Um, it, it may be like in a flashback, but I do think it's kind of important that we actually see that. So we really understand like the, that's really get a distinct visual image of what that is, as opposed to just being from the kid's sketch. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, exactly how that plays out. Not, not, I think whether it's in the moment, like we, we're tracking with him, it's just sort of like getting the audience ahead of him or getting the audience ahead of um, us. It's a good question. Um, uh, if going forward from there, do you want me to jump ahead? Please. So there, uh, there's a big mystery engine, obviously you like at the center of that. And I want to talk about it really briefly because really it's in service of generating these emotional stories. And so, um, so I wanted to get those out of the way quickly because I think the interesting stuff is on the other side. At the end of the pilot, there are three big questions. Uh, the first question is, what is happening to these kids? Second is, who or what is causing it? And the last question is, why? And over the course of the first season, we're going to answer all those questions. It's not really like a slow burning mystery. You want to get to all those. Because like I said, I think there's really interesting stuff, interesting new stuff on the other side of answering those questions. Um, so first, what is happening to these kids is that uh, they're, they're, they're evolving. They're sort of in this metamorphosis. And, and what's happening to them is that they're, um, the computational power of their brains is rapidly increasing to the point that they're essentially becoming like supercomputers, but supercomputers uh, who can still make moral and ethical decisions. So as you're going through this process, this metamorphosis, it takes quite a toll physically. Uh, not all the kids make it, not all the mineral city kids make it. They don't survive, which is a big part of the reason why so many of these kids were chosen, that, that not all of them are gonna survive. Um, but the ones that do very quickly learn who is behind this. The answer to that is, they find that they have been psychically connected to this alien civilization that exists light years away. Um, and not just connected to this alien civilization, but they've also been connected to each other that connected to all these kids around the world via this like hidden telepathic neural network that they call the slipstream. And through that connection and through this connection to this alien civilization, they learn finally the why. And the why is that Earth is on the verge of environmental cataclysm it's going to be an extinction level event. This specific generation of kids was chosen because they're going to be the ones who are here, the first to suffer uh, the consequences of it. And so they've been upgraded for the purpose of receiving, uh, comprehending and executing a plan to save our species by building this piece of technology that this alien civilization has designed. Uh, but the catch is they have to get started now. <laughs> Time is of the essence. So, uh, as we're discovering all these things, governments react predictably, uh, and by that I mean poorly. Uh, our own government seeks to, you know, control this. How do we contain this? Is this a threat? Um, but kind of what I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm less interested in what's happening at the Pentagon. I'm more interested in what happens to the people around these affected kids, their loved ones, their friends, family members, neighbors, who start to see them as the other, who start to see them as a potential threat rumors start to spread, conspiracy theories on social media. Now all these people, you know, people who might have been your kindergarten teacher now think that you might possibly be you know, bringing about the end of civilization. You may be working for this alien intelligence. And so I think there's a real uh, sense of that, of, of positioning people on one side or the other. Do you believe these kids uh, or not? But then there's also this thing with the kids themselves. You know, they're, they're plagued by their own self-doubt. How do they know that this alien intelligence really has their best interests at heart? Are they creating a path to salvation or are they creating a path to our destruction? Um, that's one of the things that they're going to have to figure out and work out with each other. Um, and on top of that, like they're just kids. They never ask for any of this stuff. Um, Mickey, are, yes. are the kids allowed to go live at home or are they sequestered somehow? Not sequestered yet. I'm gonna, I'll come to that in just a little bit. I think that, you know, they, there will be a period where they're sort of hospitalized. And then I think that they're, they're going to be allowed to go home, to, to go home. Uh, and then there's, I think by the end of the season, when it's like, Hey, it, it, you know, the word spreads that yes, these kids are in contact with this alien civilization. That's going to be a turning point where it's like, okay, now we have to contain these kids in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that plays out in the, cause I think that's a season two story. Um, putting them in these internment camps, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, we're just going to look at this here real quick and jump back to my notes. Um, I think just thematically for a second, the, to me, a lot of what this is about is about the sort of like fear and, and apathy and contraction that comes with aging 
the older generations. I feel like it's one of, I, I always feel like the aging is a battle of expansion versus contraction. And that, you know, if you contract, you're sort of, you know, less open-minded. And, um, and, and, but younger generations have this sort of more open, inclusive worldview and this sort of more optimistic, hopeful thing. And so the big question is, will they be better than us? Can they be better than us? Will this be the generation that finally brings us together uh, as a global community? Um, or, you know, when faced with resistance and oppression and even violence from, you know, the people that they love and, and the people in their communities, will they have to become the very thing that their elders fear? And so I think there's an ongoing tension with that. Um, and again, those are big ideas, but all lens through the family. So to tell you a little bit about how that plays out in their personal emotional stories, you know, for Abby, this becomes a, a, a big source of tension between her job and her family, because her job is she's sworn to protect the people in this town. Um, and this has real ramifications there. You know, like after 9-11, after drug and alcohol abuse doubled the baseline. And so after this event happened, there's a lot of stress on families. The things that are already there, those problems are exacerbated. And so she's dealing with that on that front. And now she's also dealing with the fact that like, there are a lot of people in town who view these kids as a threat. And that threat is living under her roof. You know, she doesn't see it that way, but like other people too. And so she's kind of put in these sort of moral and ethical gray areas as to how she deals with that. Um, but I think there's also a story for her that is a bit of a crisis of faith. You know, for somebody who grew up a believer, who did all the right things, who devoted her life in service to people, now this has happened. Like, what kind of God would do this to her family? What, you know, why would, why would he or she do this to her and, and her family? And, and, um, and then a crisis of faith in her community. Like, I've served these people, and now they're turning on me and my family. How do I keep going? You know, how do I, how do I wake up every day and go to work and give them my best? Um, and so I think there's some really interesting stories to there, you know, there for her. And I think, um, yeah, and just seeing her come through that and, and, and keeping that alive. Um, for Ben, it's a, he has his own crisis of faith, which is, you know, when this thing happens, it sort of puts, forces him to put his money where his mouth is. The universe is a really strange and interesting place. And now that's living under his roof, right? And so the thing that he has to place his faith in uh, is something that he's always struggled with, which is his son. You know, this kid that he's sort of always on his back, you're not living up to your potential. And now I have to put my faith in you. I have to put my trust in you uh, when you say that this is going on and that this is what you need from me. Um, for Graham, I think it's a really interesting story. And for a lot of the affected kids, they're suffering physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, they're being experimented on. How can we reverse this? There's a lot of that going on. I was thinking of like Richard Dreyfus, but if he was a teenager, uh, you know, close encounters, but he was you know, a teenager going through this stuff. Um, there's a lot of fun to be had if you are suddenly 18 years old and you are 10 times smarter than all the people like in, you know, I know that the first thing I, you would probably try to do is like, how do we buy beer? Well, that'd be easy, right? Like, yeah, how do we, uh, you can, you can figure your way around any, you know, any, any scam because you're smarter than all the people who are in charge of you. But this kind of intelligence is an emotional intelligence. So they still have teenage hormones, relationships, things like that. And what's happening to Graham is that as he's changing, that he is being alienated. You know, he's in this sort of like special, class of these affected kids. And now he's being alienated from his band buddies and his girlfriend. Um, things are kind of falling apart there. Uh, and he finds himself bonding more and more with these affected kids. Um, and in particular, falling in love with this, this fellow affected girl named Casey. And then as people in the town start targeting him as these conspiracy theories and things start to spread, um, these kids are targeted for violence. He starts to emerge as a leader of this group. And this really forces him to live up to that potential, this thing that his parents always thought that he could. Um, you know, for Liddy, she turns to YouTube and she's, she's watching, you know, trying to process this and taking information. Uh, and she comes across this group, uh, sort of subculture of siblings of affected kids who have dubbed themselves the forgotten. So the affected kids are getting all the attention. These, the forgotten kids are the ones who are sort of left literally and figuratively to their own devices. Uh, I think, you know, starving for some connection and some attention, she makes the decision to run away from home and, and takes off to a bigger city where she joins up with one of these groups. Um, and, and is through that process really forced to grow up a lot faster uh, than she would have otherwise. Uh, and then Maya, Maya's on this army base. She's hearing about all these things that are happening, like that her family's being targeted, that sort of you know, violence is erupting in the town. Uh, and she makes a decision to go AWOL and come back home to protect them. And this is a decision that comes with no small amount of shame, both internal, because she's abandoning her post, and then external, she gets home. Uh, and this grandfather, this person that she's always idolized, is like, you know, you're a coward for leaving your post. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of that for her to deal with. And then 
again, kind of like her mother. It's like, I, you know, I, I went away. I, I went to serve because I, I love these people, this town. I wanted to serve and protect them. Um, and now they're the enemy across the street. And, and, and she's the only person sort of willing to fight back. How does that play out? Um, so I think there's a lot, again, sort of like the episode by episode, this first season is so much about throwing these challenges to this family and seeing how this sort of, you know, quote unquote, ordinary everyday family uh, struggles through this major paradigm shift, you know, as all these things are happening. And it really is about on an, on an ongoing basis, just like organic way to continually find the drama in that story, the human drama in that story. So going back to your earlier question, like in season two, what happens if the government, the US government says, this has gone too far, we need to put these kids in internment camps, uh, regional internment camps, we need to monitor them, we need to keep you know, finding ways to reverse this, finding ways to disrupt this connection. Abby makes a very controversial decision, which is I'm gonna advocate and win one for Mineral City. So I'm gonna put one here. Well, the last thing half the town wants is for more of these affected kids from all over the region to be you know, in the city limits. Um, does she cross some moral and ethical lines to get this done uh, for personal reasons? Because she wants her son to stay close. For Ben, you know, as things escalate, Ben gets to the point where he's like, well, "Let's just leave. <laughs> like, why are we staying here? You know, like, let's go to a bigger city. There are better hospitals. There are more resources." And Abby's like, "This is our home. You know, these are our. This is these are our people. My friends, my family here. Um, and you know, we're going to see a lot of the beautiful side of that too, and the people who come to their aid." Um, that she's and why she's not willing to leave, but it does set up a sort of organic uh, conflict between the two of them because they still have one kid to raise. You know, Lydia, are they really going to subject her through this? Um, and then uh, for Graham, the affected kids, the tr the real challenge is that like, okay, now we know that the clock is ticking. We believe that this is we believe we're doing the right thing, um, but now we're being closely watched. Is this basically what happens when twelve million of the smartest people on earth decide that enough is enough? Right, it's time to take control of the situation, and we got to start to fight back. Will they resort to violence with violence? Again, like this is something that all these kids, culture to culture, going to have to work out together. Um, and uh, and as we see, when a lot of these challenges happen, that it's going to bring out the worst in people, but it, it also has the opportunity to bring out the best. And so, just sort of in, in in closing, about like in season two and where I see this going and beyond, I think this is this is a series that could go to some sort of very dark places as we explore that. But ultimately what I want to end on is, a, is a, 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 a hopeful ending. I truly believe that these kids, like I believe in the kids that exist today who are marching in the streets and, and doing all these great things, that the kids in this story are going to pull us together as a global community. They're going to, they're going to build this thing. They're going to save our species. Uh, and in doing that, that they are going to prove us worthy uh, uh, of joining this sort of cosmic community. And to me, I, I think when I think about the end of the series, what's, a, what's the sort of end point, the, the a big sequence or something in the finale episode, it is that having done that, having having achieved this massive, uh, the, you know, ex ex extraordinary achievement, that we get to meet our closest neighbors in a kind of close encounters, big genre, you know, sci-fi satisfying ending. Uh, again, thanks to these extraordinary kids and this extraordinary family. Um, and I do want to say, I'm just gonna look through my notes here and just make sure that I didn't miss anything as I want to, um, before I wrap it up. But the, the last thing I want to say is, this is going to sound a little bit crazy, but I think there's an opportunity here for, um, for these stories to exist because this is happening all around the world. What I think would be awesome in success is the ability to partner with storytellers around the world in other countries who could launch their own stories in their native languages, you know, with their own you know, you know, actors and storytellers, directors, um, to talk about how an event like this would ripple through their own cultures and communities. Um, how would a family in South Korea deal with the fact that, that their, their kid fell prey to this? How, you know, how would various governments around the world react? Uh, and, I, and what I think is sort of awesome about it and why I think this is the kind of thing that we could really use now is that um, taken in the aggregate as like one big mosaic of all these stories of how these various cultures approach this, it would really be almost like a, a, a sort of global mosaic of how we could all pull together to meet these existential challenges. Um, and I feel like that that is not just a story that we could really use right now, um, but it's also exactly the kind of story that people like us should be telling uh, right now. So that is it. That is epic. Really, really well pitched. Um, Thank you. I, I have a few more questions. Um, so a lot of it seems to take place in this small town. Yeah. Is that by design or is there a point at which we're going to broaden it out? And 
beyond that, I mean, we also have, I guess, the the, AI, the, the alien element. Yep. Um, and I'm wondering, are we gonna go there? How much are we gonna learn about that? So I guess it's two questions. One is, are we, are we staying in the small town? Are we broadening? And then the second question is, how much are we learning about the aliens? And yeah, when? awesome. Yeah, I, I think that there's the, the, the thing that I think is really exciting about this is there's a chance to open up the scope of this um, and really open up and it's, it's thematic, it's character driven, sort of emotional um, through this thing, the slipstream, through this hidden telepathic neural network. Through that, these kids in Mineral City can communicate with kids around the world. Um, when the when the app um, Periscope came out, I don't know if you use that or not. But it's like you you open up Periscope and there's this globe, and then you click on a you know thing in like Iceland, and all of a sudden you're in somebody's kitchen watching them make breakfast in Iceland. That was so thrilling to me, right? And so imagine if like you're a kid like Graham, and you can make that telepathic connection with a kid in Iceland or a kid in Tokyo, mm -hmm. and you know you need to have this you have this computational problem or something you're working out and all of a sudden you get to travel there via this telepathic network and you're and you're there so i think there's a really cool way to open up the story that way um and in terms of the alien intelligence what i think i what i think would be weird is if we introduced physical aliens you know at a certain point through the show you know, i think they have to exist out there um as as a sort of enigma for a while because i, I I think the question of whether or not they're good or bad, you know, the audience at times may question that too. Um, and again, like I said, sort of one of the things that the kids are going to have to figure out. And I think if they do communicate with these kids as they start to communicate with these kids, and, and we really learn why that they did that. And that the answer to that is like, as I was sort of researching these things, and you read an article that was about if there are these advanced civilizations out there, they've likely gone through the same problems that we're going through now. And, and if, they've, if they've survived long enough to contact us or to find us, then that means that they've survived it and that, they've, you know, like that, they've, uh, that they have found the solution to the problem. So what happens if they can't reach us physically in time to help us, but they can help us by you know, transmitting these plans? Um, and so I think if they're in communication with these kids, it's got to be in some form that the kids recognize, whether it's sort of like a shared virtual world where they appear to be human um, and then really meet them in their true form at the, at the end. So tonally, like visually, it's sort of grounded in a way. I mean, what comes to mind for me, I don't know if you ever thought about this when you were conceptualizing it, but is the Americans. Yeah. Because yeah. Oh, this yeah. crazy spy thing out there happening, but really it's about this family and how they deal with this incredibly heightened situation. So I wasn't sure if you had aliens in every episode, it would obviously take you in a different place. Yeah, and I think that's the thing too. It's like, and I, like I've, I've done this myself and I think there are stories you sort of run the risk when it's about like SWAT teams descending in the middle of the night. It's really like, you know, in the Americans, they had, there were national stakes and, and you know, global stakes, um, but they had to go home and make dinner. Yes. They had to have those uncomfortable dinners where everybody had a secret. And, you know, and, and I, that really is, it's, it's a great comp because there are a lot of elements to that, uh, mm -hmm. to that here too. Um, oh, you, Maya, the sister who comes back, when you, you didn't mention her being present in the pilot. Do we see her in the pilot? How do we get familiar with her? What's gonna be her role? I think we I think we'd definitely want to introduce her in the pilot that she gets this news and there is this sort of like push and pull between her, you know, what she feels is her duty and and her to her, you know, to the, the military, but also duty to her family. Um, I think that she is one of the storylines that I'd like to follow for a bit, which is, you know, maybe in the second episode, if there is a, uh, you know, turmoil that breaks out in a larger city that she is called to help that. And as she sees that like, Things are getting bad here in this sort of like mid-sized city. That's only going to have it's it's going to trickle down. It's going to happen in my town too, um, and then follow her on that journey. But I think going forward, there's an interesting story for her too. Like uh, one of the things I would like to do, I think a cool story is that as Liddy goes missing, you know, if Liddy runs away from home and she goes into say like an occupied zone a couple hours away in Cincinnati or Lexington or some city like that, that that Maya would have to be the one to go after her. You know, maybe Maya and Ben together but you know Maya's the one who has to like really who's willing to like go to the darker places to get her sister back um and there's a story you know what's the road back look like between these two sisters who because of the age difference maybe never really had a relationship but now have this bond between the two of them as they're as they're on this road together so the show is really an ensemble you would you wouldn't say like Abby and Ben are the leads or, or would you no no I, I wouldn't say I think it's a, very much an ensemble like something like Brian and Lights was the ensemble okay you know, somebody's storyline may take precedent, the A story of that episode, while they're sort of, you know, uh, recede to the B and C stories. But um, 
because yeah, I really think it's about all these people and how all these threads are continually complicating and intersecting with each other. Really, really well told. Um, thank you so much for, for, for doing this. You know that we both know that's code that you're not going to buy. I know. I sorry, <laughs> it was so hard not to laugh. I said it twice. This is where we conclude the acting portion. Yes. Um, there are some questions that Danielle pulled together from both um, online and uh, and from from them. And they're uh, they're broken into sort of two parts. And some are story questions, and some are um, tech process questions and stuff too. So Danielle, what would you like to do? Would you would you want to ask like some story questions, or do you want to jump to process? Well, there think? there was one from Twitter, but you answered that one in your intro, so that was great. And I know Robin has sent in some questions, and Lisa had one. So maybe start with Lisa with your one question, and then we can go to Robin. Um, yeah, I was curious how you would um, alter a pitch like this if it was for a feature. Is, for a feature. It, is it done any kind of different way? Do you? I mean, it's like I'm working on one feature pitch right now. And um, yeah, I mean, it really is. I, I just, what I've found is sort of working for me is a lot of setup, a lot of act one, pitching more detail in act one. And then once I'm sort of off and running, it's like, okay, at the end of act, by the end of act one, we're on this mission now and here are a few tentpole moments but here are the character emotional stories and here's this turn into act three and here's where we end up so uh melissa because you've done a lot more feature pitching than i have is that similar to you that's that's right on i mean i think it's exactly like you said you want to bring the emotion in the beginning lay out act one and then kind of like sail through the arc i maybe a little bit more specific about the arc of the the main characters and how they change over time you've got so much more time to work with um, so maybe I would take a moment to focus on that, but otherwise, yeah, exactly what you said. Cool. Thank you. Robin. Oh, Melissa actually asked a lot of the story questions I had, but one thing I was curious about is how did the global franchise portion go over in your pitches? Um, at some of the streamers that I think are striving for like a global audience, I think there was, it, I think it was interesting. Um, but again, I'm kind of like, you know, it's not something that I've seen a lot of people do yet. And it was really kind of born out of like this idea that I thought, um, for just me personally, like, I think that'd be so cool to me, you know, like, cause I know this is how we would react. You know, there's a very good chance that we would react this way, but I don't know how these other cultures react. And so it'd be super cool to have people, you know, those storytellers tell that story. Um, and then hopefully we all kind of end up in the same place and, and use the, you know, first season of this, of our, you know, sort of U.S. version as a timeline to lay the foundation for a timeline. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, I don't think anybody landed on it hard by the end. It was like, hey, that's, that would be a big reason why we would want to buy this. I think it just sort of was, was sort of interesting. You know, I don't know that it was so specific to this one, like, high concept idea that I don't know I would ever do it again. I loved hearing it. And the reason is because it showed your passion. I mean, it, it just was another way. It's like, I think this is an international phenomenon, which you, but I mean, okay. you sold it. So I, I like for me, what I'm buying today, I'm the buyer, what I'm buying is passion. You know, I want someone who has a vision for this and you showed that you really do have like an incredible long-term vision. So I, I thought it was great. So you're buying it on the Zoom. You bought it on the Zoom. I, you guys, I totally would have bought it on the Zoom, but we had pre-agreed that I was going to say well told, which means I'm not buying it. <laughs> I, I have to say, I have done a lot of pitches. That was a fantastic pitch. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this is an impartial, you know, completely impartial third party, but um, just the- Third party, thank you. You didn't look down. I mean, I think I look down a lot. I guess maybe it's different because you're on Zoom, but I bring notes and I have to really stop and look down at them a lot. And you were so fluid. Um, and I threw you off, I tr was trying to throw you off your game a little bit um, a couple of times and it just didn't work because you knew it so well. So um, that's well, like, that. you guys really just saw a masterclass. Well, I mean, I, I, because I wanted to do like, hey, this is what it's gonna look like. This is what it looks like when I do it. I really wanted to prep just like I would. So I tried to, you know, try to know it pretty cold. And you did, you almost threw me off. I had to, I had to go back to these. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I wanted them <laughs> to get, you know, like it's really stressful, you guys. It's super, <laughs> they ask random stuff. Uh, Danielle, James, do you guys have any more questions you want to ask? I did have one that came up while you were pitching the second season and beyond. I was just curious how many seasons out do you go? I know it's not a formal, this is going to be four seasons or whatever, but just kind of in your head. And then also you touched on how you wanted it to end. 
do you ever feel like you have to land on an ending in a pitch or can it be more broad like you did today? I mean, I, I, in general, I don't pitch an end image or something like that. Again, it was really specific to this, this idea because I think there's sort of, there's also a little bit of showmanship to that too, which is like, you know, it's like you're going along, you're going along. It's like, you know, it's very sort of like uh, realistic and kitchen sink. And then like, we're going to end on this, you know, like ship coming out of the sky or something like that. Right. And so there's a little right. bit of that. Um, but I think, so I normally wouldn't try to pitch like a specific ending because I think it's, you know, it's a little bit of uh, to think that you can plot out five or six seasons and know exactly where you're going, you know, things change so much once they buy it and there's input mm -hmm. and, you know, you, 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 cast actors and you shoot the pilot and it's one relationship doesn't quite work so you kill that character off and you, you know so, so trying to like build everything around um very specific turns and specific character things is is really tough and so i generally try to generally just give like a very um more broad overview of the kinds of stories i want to tell and, and the continuing sort of emotional stories um so the ending is very specific to this pitch um and i think in terms of like the question personally as i was pitching it I would think four seasons, you know, four to five seasons. I think chronologically, this doesn't span 20 years, you know, it may span two or three. And so, um, but I also am just kind of trying to keep it loose because I feel like, you know, a lot of stuff on Netflix these days, two seasons and done. You know, like mm -hmm. three seasons. So there may not be the appetite for broadcast, you know, network to you, know, like in the old days of like, let's, let's let this baby go till the wheels fall off. You know, so, uh, mm -hmm. so I'm trying not to pitch like, but if I was pitching a procedural, I'd be like, hey, there are 200 stories we can tell, you know, with right. this ending. So. James, did you have anything? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Um, do you have some good tips for if you feel like their interest is flagging or that you've lost them or you start to see people looking away? I mean, do you, do you have things that you do to draw them back in? It's tough. I feel like it's in person. I, I struggle with that even in person. I try to like, because I know the pitch so well, I can start to condense things. And sometimes I'll kind of even just sort of shine a light on it and be like, oh, if I if I kind of feel that, I'll be like, you know, I just want to tell you just like really briefly about the second season. And then I'm going to hit the, and then I'll tell you the end. So I kind of almost like let them know, like off the, let them off the hook. Like this is going to be over soon. <laughs> or just like, and so that I can hopefully kind of like re-engage them that way. But I try to read the body language. On Zoom, it's a little harder. Um, you know, because and also it's it's hard. What I found on Zoom pitches is that you know everybody's uh, muted and sort of not expecting to have to respond to things. And so sometimes I'll be like, you know, any questions, and then people are like, you know, trying to unmute. And so yeah, it's a little hard to feel out. I, but I, my tricks are just like trying to watch for body language. If somebody looks at their watch, and then just start to like condense if I can on the fly. And I can only do that if I know it cold. What about you, Melissa? How you feel? About well, I was going to first say, I mean, some execs just look bored all the time. Like you can walk in and like, there was this one, I won't even say what network because we'll, I'll tell you later, but, <laughs> but like, I was told by the producers beforehand, he's going to look like he's falling asleep. Don't let it get to you. And he totally did the whole time. He didn't buy it though. So who knows? Um, but I, so the first thing I would say is like, try not to let it throw you. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, if it's, if it can make you, um, wrap up quicker or sometimes I just stop and say oh let me st I'm sorry I realize I've been talking so much you know is there anything I can write yeah. there because then they have to focus on you and even I mean it's also it's not necessarily personal to you or your pitch they hear during I mean yeah. again the seasons are changing now it's like all year round but when they're hearing a lot of pitches sometimes they're hearing what is it like 10 in a day yeah um, exactly. and like especially if you go in right before lunch or at the end of the day I mean they're really zonked so it, they may be loving it and they just look completely wiped out okay, exactly so. i find so and i find you can genuinely tell like the, oh sorry yeah, Lisa's right. so if you um you just condense you don't like redirect or skip to a new thing or i mean i don't think you can because they may not really be bored. they might not be yeah okay no i just think you don't want to if you have stuff you need to say um you need to say it yeah. So whether or not they're, you know, it's like they need to know how you plan, you know, what you think the arc's going to be or whatever. Um, but yeah, if you if you think they seem bored, I guess say it in a in a quicker way. Well, like for me, like an example, Lisa, like if I'm pitching like an action sequence and I've got a cool set piece worked out that I think is fun to pitch. And then I see that it's kind of going a little long. I'll be like, and then there's this really cool pitch where they have a, you shoot out in the tunnel and you know, <laughs> instead yeah. of pitch, you know, instead of pitching like, and then a cargo truck, you know, drops from the sky. You're like, sort of beat by beat of that. I just try to like, just feel it out and keep moving. Um, 
what else? Other, more questions? Sorry, buddy. I just scared my dog. I'm moving around. Yeah, I'll, um, it was actually, uh, I don't know. I hope this makes sense. But um, I want to say it was after something Melissa asked about uh, in the pilot when um, all the kids see the same image, like when they're in a coma. And I think maybe I'm speaking just for myself, but a lot of um, newer writers or writers who haven't pitched a lot, like in our minds, we see pitching as something where it's like you have to have maybe a concrete answer for everything or you have to like everything you need to know, like the back of your hand, everything. I think your answer to that question was really interesting because you were like, it was kind of like a, like you had an idea, but it wasn't like something where you were like 100%, they all like we're with them when they see it or we find out after he wakes up. Like, so is that something that was specific for this pitch or is it kind of like people who haven't done it before maybe were overthinking it and it is more conversational where you can sort of like say yeah like it's in the pilot now it's this way but i'm not like married to this or do you yeah I that I mean, that's an excellent question because i because i uh, early on even like even not just like pitching shows but like let's say you know we've come up with ideas for the first couple episodes of extant and so we've got to pitch those to the studio and then the network and then to Mr. Spielberg, right? And so these questions would come up and I would get this anxiety of that I have to know all the answers. And so the worst thing I did, the thing that I still gives me like a little bit of a panic attack today is like trying to like riff in the moment when I actually wasn't, you know, like inspired with an idea uh, and feeling that kind of land, like, you know, be like, well, maybe it could be like this. And oh, it's like your brain is just like short circuiting because you're like, they're going to think I don't know what I'm doing if I don't say the right thing. And so after having suffered the humiliation of that <laughs> more than one time, I got comfortable with saying, that's a great question. I haven't really thought about that, that aspect of it yet. Um, but you know, like, I, but that is, that is something in the area that I'm really interested in. I mean, ideally, like I have an idea of the world outside of this pitch in the story. And so hopefully it will connect to something or it's something that I've thought of that I can connect to. Um, but I am pretty comfortable now saying, that's that's actually an aspect I haven't thought of, but it's a really interesting avenue to explore. You know, what about you, Melissa? I, I totally agree. The only caveat I would make is um, sometimes they'll suggest something like, "Oh, did you ever think about making, you know, Ben, a you know, a, a rocket scientist? Because then he could discover what happened to the aliens or whatever." Um, I was actually wondering if you made him a science teacher for like so that he could figure stuff out. But yeah. but I mean. Point being, they, put, they pitch you an idea that's really not what you want. And I think there's a trap where you would wanna like make them happy. Don't do that necessarily. I mean, unless it's really something you're open to, you wanna sell it. And I totally understand that. I've made this mistake so many times of being like, oh, I guess it could be done that way. But then they think you don't have a vision. They think you're kind of like, oh, she doesn't really know what story she's telling. If it's really an off, off topic, they do. I mean, have you ever had weird questions like that where like, hey, did you ever consider doing this thing? And it's like really a terrible idea. Yeah, well, I mean, there's something, or just like that's a, it's just a, such a right turn, you know, like a 90 degree angle from what you're doing. Like, I remember I had one thing with you know, Reverie, it was like a development meeting, and the question came up of like, well, you know, these are solitary virtual environments. This person is creating these things. Like, wouldn't it be cool if it was shared? It's like you all go into this virtual world together. And and to me, it was like, and I kind of brought it back. I was like, well, the reason it's like this is, you know, part of the theme of the story is that we're all sort of living in our own sort of bubble anyway out here in this real world that we live in now. And so it really is about creating this perfect environment. So if I wanna live in an environment where every restaurant is a uh, uh, Shake Shack, you know what I mean? Like, and I wanna enjoy that, like that's specific to me and I don't necessarily want other people intruding that, right? And so I was able to kind of explain the thematic reason of why I didn't necessarily. So, but yeah, so those things come up and it's like, if, you know, I could see that if there maybe is a different scenario where I felt like I really want to just sell this thing. I'm like, yeah, that could be cool. Let's talk about that and go. And then later on the drive home, be like, eh, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> so I just, I've had, I've said it where I felt like I, in answering it that way, I came off as wishy-washy. Like yeah. I didn't really know. And I think the key and what was so great about your pitch is you really do have a vision and you really do know what the theme is. And so any question they ask you, you know whether that could even be conceivable within the boundaries of that. So you can say to your question, James, like with confidence, oh, that's that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it, but that could work because you know that it could. Yeah. Thank you. Um, God, so I think that's it, right? I mean, there's all the questions. I think, and Danielle, you sent me some more and I will, um, 
I'll answer these in the Twitter thread below too. And, and by the way, for anybody, who, if anybody is out watching out there um, and you have some questions, just put them in that thread and then uh, I'll jump on and answer them. And then anybody else, Melissa, you're welcome to jump in and answer too, if you want to. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for our, I think that's it for our mock UN pitch. So thank you all so much. Thank you. I just want to thank both of you so much. This was great. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's such a wall up around this and you don't know what you don't know. So this has been so helpful and I appreciate you opening this up for everybody as well. Well, thank you. It's a great, it was a great idea. And I thought, man, it is so helpful. And I, it is something that I would love to have seen before, you know, mm -hmm. like when I was in the same position and so super happy to do it. And, and, um, and Justin Trevina, thank you both so much. I know that's a lot of like, you know, there's, there's a lot of story to cover. And so I really appreciate you both being here as well. Yes. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a, rest, have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.